Hmm, how provocative, the empty homes tax, you know? What does that mean? Here on Talking Tax with Tom, that's Tom Yamachika of the Hawaii Tax Foundation, Tax Foundation of Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel, this is Think Tech. I want to examine empty homes today. So Tom, welcome to the show. And what is the empty homes tax? Well, glad to be on the show, Jay. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the empty homes tax, uh, which is, uh, I think, a little bit more, uh, has a little more steam behind it now that uh, Honolulu, the city and county of Honolulu has tried a, uh, a tax or, or uh, restrictions on transient vacation rentals and the federal courts uh, kind of giving some resistance to that. It's ordered an injunction against them. So the idea- what, what, What's the basis for the resistance? Um, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, the injunction could be like balance of a balance of harms kind of thing, but uh, I, I didn't I didn't read the injunction order. But but when we're, we're talking about the empty homes tax, the idea behind that is to uh, free up more housing for people, and the, and the and the way it works is this: if you own a house or a condo, you don't live in it and you don't allow anyone else to live in it, then you need to pay a hefty tax. Uh, the version of the bill uh, that, that is now before the Honolulu City Council, which is called Bill 9 of 2022, uh, sets that tax at 3% of the property value per year. So a single family home which is worth a million dollars, which happens to be the median value of such homes would face a $30,000 tax in addition to the regular real property tax for each year that it's unoccupied. Proponents of the bill say it's a fair price for taking that property out of the housing supply and therefore contributing to our housing shortage here. You know, we have a housing shortage. So that's how it works. What's the point? To alleviate the housing shortage? Yes. And, and to punish tourists or or people who have transient homes here. Well, I mean, there are people around that have multi-million dollar houses and apartments who uh, $30,000 wouldn't bother them, nor would sixty dollars or $90,000 bother them. They're not going to allow strangers in the property, don't you think? Probably not. Um, that's still kind of a hefty price. Uh, the, the, the bill is supposed to be uh, modeled after something that has uh, been implemented in the city of Vancouver, Canada, uh, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, according to testimony uh, before the city council, it resulted in a 26% reduction of vacant homes and $106 million in new tax revenues since 2018. So how do you enforce um, a bill like this? I mean, you mentioned in your notes that it was hard to enforce and a lot of people felt it was unenforceable. But how, at least theoretically, would you enforce it? Well, what the, what the law, uh, it, what the bill provides is that all property owners would need to fill out an annual declaration form to tell tax authorities about whether the property was occupied. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, you, so you fill this out, you send it in, and, and hope that there's no enforcement action against you. But as you probably can tell, uh, and, and as we've seen a lot before, uh, not everybody tells the truth on such forms. So uh, how, how do lawmakers expect that the city would know uh, when a house is occupied or not? Um, they have a know. stiff, you have a stiff penalty in case uh, they find out that um, you know you lied. And uh, I suppose you could have. Always is one. And it's a crime. Yeah. Oh, it is a crime. Uh, oh, okay. yeah. It's perjury. So it's misdemeanor. Um, it might be a felony. Perjury is perjury is a serious crime. Yeah. So to enforce it, to find out whether somebody has violated it and thus uh, arrest them or whatever, um, you have to have the empty homes police. Right. You have to have a. <laughs> People, people who either A, 
you know, verify what you said in that declaration, or B, they go and they visit, sui sponte, they go and they visit the place, knock on the door, uh, and if there's, uh, uh, I guess if there's nobody there, this is hard. <laughs> if, there's, if there's nobody there, uh, then you have a problem. Maybe, maybe you have to go and knock on the door, um, you know, every hour for all day, maybe the, the second and third day thereafter, but I'm not sure that's, that's completely dispositive either. So how how can you prove a negative? That's what it amounts to. It's, yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. if you've seen like some of these uh, 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 police uh, dramas on TV, you know, you can have like somebody sneaking up and putting a little piece of paper in the in the in the in the door jam, right? And uh, then coming back a couple of days later, if that piece of paper is still there, yeah. well, then you go write this up. Why do I feel it's going to be hard to get a conviction on that basis? You know what it sounds like? It sounds like uh, when they when they uh, decide your car has been parked for too long in a given location, they put a little chalk mark on the tire. Uh, and if the, the same chalk mark is in the same spot X days later, uh, you know, then you, you have been found guilty. <laughs> it's very hard. Yeah, houses don't have tires, though. That's a, that's a problem. That's the problem. Um, yeah, so... so, so you can see that, that the devil is going to be in the details. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have to have a, a property tax police. Uh, maybe maybe you do stakeouts in the middle of the night, you know, with, with people kind of peering at, you know, through their through their infrared goggles uh, or telescope, or, um, or or maybe they can do such something like as mundane as looking at the property's water bill. Well, yeah, and I was thinking, you know, okay, so you what you do is you do. The assessment, you know, for the empty home, presumptively. And we're, okay, you know, uh, here's a thirty thousand dollar assessment, and you can have the assessment, you know, removed or re whatever, you know, re reversed. Um, if you come in and show a water bill and a and a light bill and I don't know what something to prove that somebody was there, and and so you have this um, sort of reverse proof. I think. What do you think? Well, I think that's that's what they're worried about, um, because you may remember, like when we did residential A, uh, which is the uh, uh, the tiered property tax here in Honolulu, also on uh, homes that don't qualify for a home exemption. So it's a similar concept, but there. Uh, you, you can file a home exemption form just once, continue to live in it, and, and they'll keep the exemption going, mm -hmm. right? This is a form you got to file every year. Mm -hmm. But even, even with the, the home exemption form in, prop, in uh, residential A, some homeowners never, never bothered to file the form. And what, hap what happened? They don't care about the extra tax? When the when they when they, when the tax bill came, they cared. They went, ah, what's going on here? And and, and they and they quickly uh, leaped down to their the council members and to their uh, you know the the authorities and made a made a big fuss. And uh, you know a lot of those assessments were reversed, of course, mm -hmm. uh, because you know, people were saying, oh, you know, we we just uh, forgot to file the form. We really do live there. Yeah. Well, that's not unreasonable. I mean, the question is, what sort of administrative burden does it impose? Well, um, well let me city? let me finish the scenario though. That is for a form that you file once. Okay, if you got to file the form every year, that's that's orders of magnitude uh, more. Well, sure, sure. More well, uh, what, what I'm thinking is that the, the machine spits out the thirty thousand dollar. You know, a super assessment, call it the empty homes assessment. And it says, you know, you don't have to pay this. We're not going to, uh, uh, it's an assessment, but it, we're not going to collect this tax, um, you know, if you can show that somebody was living there. Um, and uh, if you do, you know, it'll be reversed. And you have 60, 90 days, whatever is a reasonable period of time, to come in with that, that evidence. And, yeah, and say, then 100,000 homeowners come in because they got this bill and and it's going to take them more than 60 or 90 days to look at all those 100,000 forms. 
and make a decision on each one of them. I mean, look at look at how the you know uh, uh, what the what the backlog is now in the in in permitting, right? And don't you think that you know the same or similar folks are going to be looking at it? Maybe. Well, let's. Let, by the way, it sounds like you would oppose this bill. Uh, we, we're not taking a position on it. We're just kind of trying to explore the consequences. Okay. Before we get to the consequences, can we get to what it's really intended to do? It's intended to what? Force landlords, owners, to make premises available. Uh, we, some of them will, some of them won't. And this, this is because we don't have enough housing. This can't be the most efficient way to do that. There's got to be so many other ways to incentivize housing, support housing. I mean, if you look across the country, not Vancouver, but across the whole country, I'm sure there are many ways that uh, municipalities and states have figured out how to incentivize housing. Isn't it true? I mean, this seems like, um, you know, um, a baseball bat. Uh, and, and as you say, it's hard to enforce it. Uh, are there so, other so ways? You're gonna, you're gonna tell people, you know, build more housing and, uh, and clog up our permitting system even more? <laughs> I mean, even, even today it takes, uh, what is it, oh. a year? Oh, to... I saw the article in the paper, I guess it was Civil Beat, it said, that if, if you don't pay a bribe, it takes uh, three years to get a to get a permit now. That, that, that's for commercial. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, three it's, years it's for got, commercial, I think one year for residential. Yeah. That's without the bribe. With the bribe, it's a, it's, it's much faster. Yeah, exactly. So, but you know, I'm thinking, um, for example, you know, we are we are concerned mostly. I mean, there's a certain anger in this kind of bill. It's, 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 Damn it, you know, we have all these people coming and buying uh, $3 million condos and the like that the local people cannot afford. I get that, for sure. We all get that. Um, and we don't want you to do that. The worst thing is you it, they build this $3 million condo and somebody from far away buys it and they never come here, you know, but once a year for a few days. And uh, it's, a, it's a corporate retreat um, and it is taking housing off the market. Um, but but uh, is there some other way to stop that phenomenon? I mean, I know the, the Commerce Clause stands in the way. That's why I asked you before about, you know, the federal courts. They would be quick um, to, uh, you know, use the Commerce Clause to stop any measure that would discriminate against people from out of state. But is there a way logically, Tom, to stop that scenario? And uh, that's, what, that's what these guys are looking to do, I think. They're trying to stop the scenario where you have rich people from far away um, offshore um, buying expensive condominiums and leaving them empty. That really is offensive. It's offensive on a number of levels. Uh, can't we do something about that? Well, well, the problem is that's, that's kind of how the economics turn out. Um, because there are, you know, people in, uh, other places, or or e even here, for, for example, uh, who like the idea of a vacation home or a, a, a home in a, a tourist destination like ours, uh, there will be demand for it. And when there's demand for it, some people will want to build, uh, you know, these humongous homes or uh, these super expensive condos, as opposed to, you know, ten or twenty smaller units for affordable housing, okay? Uh, because the supply is there. I mean, the, the supply is what they wanna give them. The demand is there. And to, to equalize uh, the demand, uh, you would have to uh, pay a whole lot more for these affordable units than, uh, than is currently happening. So well, let me go back to something that seemed to be interesting a few years ago which actually never took place. But suppose you change the state capital gains tax vis-a-vis uh, -vis these properties. Applies to everybody, you know, from offshore or not. And you said, um, you know, if, if you try to spin this thing in a year or two, whatever the spinning period would be, whatever, you know, and you can adjust it, you can tune it up later if it didn't work. Um, if, you, if you try to spin this thing inside of a year, 
you have a really confiscatory capital gains tax. I use that term only only rhetorically. Uh, we wouldn't use that legally. We wouldn't use that legally. <laughs> a really high capital gains tax, you know, like like a 75% capital gains tax. And so what you're really saying is uh, you can't make money spinning this thing. That's one example. Now, I realize it doesn't solve the whole problem, and it's only going to you know, affect a certain percentage of the, of, the, of the homes that are in this scenario. But wouldn't that and, kind you of know, thing... If, if, you, if you flip and renovate, if you renovate and then flip, you know, you're, you're going to be out of the tax anyway because it's going to take so damn long to get the permits. <laughs> to renovate the thing. That's, that's a really cute answer. Okay, I'm I'm changing my period, my changing my uh, uh, my 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 period, my spin period from say one year to three years. So if you if you if you flip this thing within three years, you're going to get dinged. It's going to be a very high capital gains tax. Okay, and that should give you enough time to renovate if that's what you want to do. Um, but wouldn't that be a big a start? You know, to cut back on the scenario in which the people come and buy expensive properties and 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 spin them and uh, and and try to make a big buck, which of course, when they try to make the big buck in the right market, what they're doing is raising the tax base for everybody. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, I, yeah, again, not even three years would work because really, this is the developers we're talking about, right? So it's it's going to take three years for the uh you know for for their permits to get through because it's going to be commercial and we're assuming no graft so <laughs> it's going to take okay, uh, i'll change i'll change my uh you know change my fact, five years my, my, change my fact okay whatever five years or and or um it's not a question of some you know units uh, within a certain limited period of time it's a question of all units all the time so, for example, you buy a condo, um, you're not going to make any uh, any capital gain on that. It, the tax will be so high that um, for as long as you hold it, you're not going to be able to resell it and, and thus increase, uh, you know, the values all around you by the appraisal method and so forth. Now, on the one hand, that hurts the state because they're not going to get the big bucks in the, in the assessments. Uh, but on the other hand, it, it, it helps the people because it means that people – are not going to go in and try to make a big buck on the appreciation. So what I'm saying is, uh, take my 75 percent and say it's permanent. You want you want to uh, you want to do a, a sale of real property, say residential real property. Um, you're going to pay 75 percent capital gain whenever. What do you think about that? Yeah, that that, that might slow the problem down a little bit, maybe. I, I'm really uh, worried about the scenario we're talking about, which is what city council and potentially the legislature are trying to fix. Uh, I don't know if they're, I think their fixing is not nuanced, but, um, you know, I think we have to do something because there are, think about it, there are an increasing number of units, especially condos, but maybe more, um, that are beyond the reach of the ordinary citizen. And we're not just talking about homeless here. We're not talking about people who are disadvantaged. We're talking about middle class where the husband and the wife and all the children work, <laughs> but they still can't afford housing. That's because right. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the terrible reality that we have here. I mean, the, the, our, our housing market is kind of really out of whack, partially because you know, we're on an island, partially because we're... Uh, or at least have been an attractive travel destination. Well, you know, uh, first you get travel, that's step one, and step two is they like it, so they want a piece of the rock. It's the old piece of the rock problem. And so they're, you know, vulnerable to sales attempts um, by all these developers. And indeed, you know, think of all the land that could have gone for something else, um, but the developer, the owner held onto it, land banked it, why? To build condos. You know, uh, neighbor islands are an interesting example of that. You know, it used to be plantation land. Uh, it, they, it, they could have um, sold it for uh, diversified agriculture. No, they hold on to it. Why? Because 
you know, at the end of the day, they want to build condos. Condos turn the biggest profit. Look at these uh, developers from offshore. They make huge profits on these expensive condos. Sometimes, somehow we got we to gotta fix that or we're going to lose the possibilities for affordable housing for the middle class in this. We are losing. We have lost. And, uh, you know, we haven't figured out how to stop that yet. I mean, maybe a, a really high capital gains tax would be one solution where it's essentially contained within guardrails of value. Um, but there's other things, too. I mean, for example, uh, oh, I don't know. We could um, do something about fee versus leasehold. Um, we could do something about um, um, uh, the, I don't know, uh, something about the way the, the condos are managed. Um, we could do something about DPP. I remember one of the big local developers said, you know, we had a housing project that took us 40 years, four zero years to build this project because of all the red tape we ran into. And, and most of that was DPP. Um, somebody talked the other day about, uh, um, a, uh, I guess it was a, a, an energy project, and uh, they had 300 concrete pads, and DPP required a, a different uh, permit application on every one of three, uh, 300 identical pads. What? <laughs> you, you couldn't batch that? You had to make them go through it 300 times, really? I mean, there's is, is a fantastic irrationality there. So um, you start with, you take a, um, everything is under examination point of view. Anything that could affect the price of a home point of view. And you start chipping away at it. You may not have any dramatic change like these bills would have, um, but at least you make housing cheaper for the middle class. We're losing the middle class. What, what kid gets out of UH and can afford a house in this town or anywhere in the island? Not a yeah, I mean, one, one, one thing that, that may have to be considered is, uh, you know, you want a piece of the rock, you, get, you, can, you can get a small piece of the rock, okay? I mean, allow, allow smaller condos or smaller dwelling units. Uh, that I think is what they had in Singapore or, 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 or the UK. Um, so, uh, so yeah, the, 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 price per acre is still astronomical, but if they're, if the acreage is small, it still might be affordable. Who knows? I know you love when I, when I digress, um, I can always tell, but let me digress. You know, you have to look at it from the oh, ground up. You haven't up. been? <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at it from the ground up. It all starts with the, the price of a foot of land. And uh, it goes it goes sideways from there, but before we get to DPP and building permits and forty years of struggle, um, and, and I've got a terrible result and people leaving town. Before we get to that, we should look at the fact that there's limited land here in these islands, and it's like any other market. If you have limited supply and increasing demand, you're going to have high prices. That's economics 101. And so uh, we are living, uh, I'm sure you've seen this in your career, we are living in a community where uh, everybody benefits by higher prices of a foot of land. So the appraiser, he benefits. And, and, he, and he has clientele who want to see it valued as high as possible because they're the seller, the owner. They want him to find a high value. We have escrow companies and title companies. They want to see a, a higher value. And, and trust me, the real estate sales uh, you know, industry wants to see a higher value. Both sides, seller and buyer, want to see a higher value. We are living in, in a pre-statehood world of everybody in a huge industry. Real estate is a huge industry in the state. Uh, who wants to see a higher value. I'm, I'm aware of an organization in the Mapuna Puna um, that wanted to limit um, the, the terms by which an appraiser could value certain aspects of appraisal, only for this exact purpose, 
to hold down the value that the appraiser found. Because traditionally appraisers work for the big money and traditionally appraisers find the highest value they possibly can. Sometimes it's really, really high. Um, and so um, this was an attempt in the legislature um, to um, correct that by changing the system, the valuation standards by which an appraiser in the state would value property. It was attacked um, by a big landowner who removed it to the federal court. And in the federal court, it was struck as unconstitutional, as special legislation, which was really a stretch in my opinion. But, and that would have helped at least in Mapuna Kuna. Um, I, I suggest to you, Tom, there are other things we can and should do uh, in every level of the food chain, every level of the real estate transactional chain to hold down these values. Some people say it's too late. We're already over the Rubicon here and those kids are leaving or will leave. Um, but, I, but I suggest that it's not too late. We just have to, have to find points along that chain and fix them. What do yeah, you think? For, what do you for, think? For example, DPP is one big point. Uh, the fact that both uh, buyer and seller's uh, real estate agent get, get compensated at 3% of the sales price, uh, which, of course, give, makes them uh, motivated to find a higher price you know, on all sides. That, that, that needs to go. Um, another, another compensation system should be set up for it. I mean, I think we have the occasional uh, realtor who tries to book the system, but, but most of the system is still in place. Uh, escrow, escrow, I think, is a, a fixed price, so that may be not as big an issue. Uh, but yeah, there are several points in the system where um, yeah, the economics just, just provide a, an, an unwelcome push toward higher prices. Yeah. So when you shake it and bake it, it seems to me there's not a lot of expertise working, although there should be, in the city council or the legislature to attack these various things. Or uh, there isn't a lot of political will because the same interests that would like to see higher prices um, don't want to see any reform on any of the points we're talking about. <laughs> they, they want prices to be high. The state is built on high property valuation. And then, and then of course, you know, you, you, you still have the supply demand problem. Uh, the, larger, the largest landowner in the state is, ready? Are you sitting down, Tom? The largest landowner in the state is the state. And the state has this concept that's built in for many, many years that it holds its land in trust for another day, maybe a day of sovereignty, who knows what. Um, and it doesn't like to let go of its land. It doesn't like to lease its land and it doesn't like to sell its land. So the result is a huge amount of land is locked up. And of course that also goes for the large trusts. Um, I remember one great comment from Harry Weinberg when uh, one of our clients wanted to buy a one foot sliver of land from him. And he said, in, in, in answering that question, no, he said, quote, <clears throat> are you ready? Are you sitting down? Said, I buy land. I hold land. I don't sell land. <laughs> so the bigger you are, the more likely it is that you will hold on to land, which limits the, the supply. And when you have a lot of organizations, including the state itself, holding on to land and not letting it go, um, that's, that's the result you get, limited supply and thus higher prices. With more, more development or possible development, with more people wanting to have their own homes, uh, this, this creates a, a big squeeze. It has created a big squeeze for years. And uh, it's time that we look at this. So I commend the guys 
uh, who put this bill in for at least recognizing the problem. Uh, I'm not sure I, I commend the, uh, um, the quality of this bill, but uh, I think it's good that we address this, not only in the city council, but in the legislature. It's yeah, time it's we- important, Very important issue to, to debate and uh, uh, look at because it is going to impact uh, the lives of you know, many everyday people. Yes. Problem. Yeah, but but uh, in terms of projecting what is going to happen to this bill, I, I would guess the answer is it will not pass. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, the um, uh, because of the concerns about uh, enforcement that we were you know, talking about, I mean, even, even the Real Property Assessment Division said, uh, look, as currently staffed and configured, we're not a property management agency. We don't have the expertise staffing more than needed resources to properly implement and administer Bill 9. So uh, the, um, I think it was the budget committee uh, said, okay, well, let's, let's hold on to this and, and, and maybe consider it sometime in the distant future, if anything. <laughs> but the reality, reality is it, it can't work because if I visit your place with my empty homes police, on day one uh, and find that it's empty. I haven't covered day two or three or four. So you have a, a who shot John kind of a, you know question of fact on every single assessment. <laughs> so it'll, it'll never work even, even if it's enforceable on day one. Ah, gee whiz. Well, it deserves more, I agree it deserves more, more thought uh, and and certainly the mission is important, and I wish uh, you know there were. I, I hope some legislators and city council members are watching this or thinking about it, because it deserves some thought. Get in a room and figure out a way to do it. Uh, at the end of the day, it's mission critical. Don't you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Tom. You know, it's a balance, isn't it? You know, we want to make it fair, but we also want to survive the public fisc because we also need money to operate the government. And so what a combination of um, demands. Okay, say goodbye to the people, Tom. Give them some advice. Tell them you want to, what you want to think about going forward. Well, I mean, we, we, we do need to uh, address this problem. It's a, it's a, it's a really big problem. Um, I, I think we should be really concentrating on you know, some of the, the, the root causes like DPP uh, that has, I think, much broader impact than you know a measure like this would have. Um, and hopefully the uh, the housing crisis will be you know more manageable when some broader reforms are enacted, and that and, and so we don't have to res resort to uh, you know, gimmicks like this. Well put, a gimmick. Thank you so much, Tom. Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Thank you so much for this discussion. See you next time. And thanks for having me on the show. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.